Welcome to week six of Old Testament 101. We've now made our way through the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and we're now entering into the section of Old Testament scripture referred to as the historical books of the Old Testament. In class six, we're going to do a brief introduction to the historical books and then do an overview of three of the historical books, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. As we begin an overview of the historical books of the Old Testament, we need to make note of the fact that there are very, very many Christians who never see any reason to study the Old Testament historical books. I guess there's a variety of reasons for this, uh, not least of which would be that a lot of people find the historical books of the Old Testament to be rather boring and tedious to read and even impractical for the modern contemporary Christian. The question is asked, what possible relevance is there to anything of the in the modern era of anything that happened over 2,500 years ago in just a little piece of the land called Canaan? What's the significance of that for us today? When we think about the main characters in this uh, historical period, they lived centuries ago. And when we consider their beliefs, their practices, their rituals, their ceremonies, their sacrifices, they seem to be so foreign to us in the modern day. And for some, they even seem to be rather insensitive as uh, compared to the practices and beliefs of uh, religion in our modern day. So, why should we spend time studying the historical books of the Old Testament? Well, there's several reasons. First of all, it's, uh, it's necessary to note that Israel's historians they produced some really wonderful works of literature. Now, that's not their purpose. Their purpose was not to create historical literature works that would be interesting and inviting to the reader. But still yet, they did, in their stories, in their books, tell thrilling stories of adventure and intrigue and excitement. And they recorded these events with great skill and great accuracy. As a matter of fact, they went to great lengths to make sure that what they were recording was historically accurate. Second, these historical books in the Old Testament have an ethical power behind them. They give us an example and they give us a warning. And in that example, the example inspires us to strive for noble, pure conduct. And yet they also give us certain words of warning that show us the consequences of not living according to the high ethical principles of uh, the Word of God. Third, the 12 historical books of the Old Testament were part of the Bible that Jesus used. Now, when we have references in the New Testament of Scripture, of course, just referring to the Old Testament Scriptures, the New Testament was being written, but it would not be a, a compilation until years and years later, matter of fact, centuries later. And so the Bible that Jesus himself read was the Old Testament scriptures. And then fourth, the Apostle Paul seemed to suggest that Old Testament history was vitally important for the modern Christian because it provided so many valuable lessons for the Christian life. So the Old Testament scriptures are vitally important for us, as Paul said, to make one wise unto salvation. So we've got the message of the grace of God, the love of God, and yes, even the gospel of Jesus Christ encapsulated in Old Testament historical writings. So a study of these historical books is vitally important for us. And again, I'll remind you of something I've already said in a previous study, that uh, Zola Levitt once made the statement, and it was a favorite statement of his, uh, 
that the Bible is a book with the answers in the back. But those answers in the back give us answer to so many questions that are presented and raised in the Old Testament, and yet we can't fully understand the New Testament without having an understanding of the Old Testament. So certainly it is vitally important for us to study and as best we can learn the principles that are taught for us in the historical books of the Old Testament. Here we have a list of the 12 Old Testament historical books, beginning with the book of Joshua and ending with the book of Esther. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then the three double volumes, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, concluding with Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And we'll give our attention to these historical books over the next couple, three weeks. Today we're going to focus on three of those books, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. The book of Joshua is a wonderfully exciting book of the Bible to read. It's filled with adventure, it's filled with intrigue, it's filled with excitement. It occurs at one of the most strategic places in the Old Testament because it's the book that actually bridges the gap between the Pentateuch and everything else that's going to follow in the remainder of the Old Testament, specifically the 12 historical books that we'll give attention to now. As we come to the conclusion of the Pentateuch, we read of the account of the death of Moses. Now this is so important. As I mentioned in last week's study, Moses has been the only leader the people have known since leaving Egypt. God raised up Moses to be their deliverer, and he has now led them for all those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, God allows Moses to go up onto the mountain and peer over into the land, but not to enter the land. And it's there that Moses dies. So now there has to be a new leader. And the book of Joshua begins with the words, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. Now it's interesting to note there that Joshua was Moses' minister. He had sort of been Moses' right-hand man. Uh, I guess in some ways we could say he was Moses' understudy. And maybe in that sense, the people uh, understood that when Moses did move off the scene through death, that Joshua would probably be his successor. And Joshua was already a very public figure and a very familiar figure. And still yet, it's going to be an extremely abrupt change, moving from the leadership of the only leader they have known to the leadership of his assistant. And so God is the one who establishes Joshua as Moses' successor, as the leader for the people of Israel. So the historical books take up where the Pentateuch left off. The Mosaic books give us Israel moving toward Canaan, and Joshua then describes Israel entering into Canaan by the very worthy leadership of Joshua himself. As we come to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we see that as Moses reminds the people uh, of the law, restating uh, the law for the people, that he gives a wonderful vision for the future of the people moving into the promised land. But now, the book of Joshua shows us that that vision becomes a venture of faith. They're about to embark on this journey that Moses had spoken of very clearly and yet was not able to lead them in. And now Joshua is going to take the mantle of leadership upon himself by the calling of God, and he is going to lead them in this great venture of faith. Since the book of the Bible is named after the leading character, 
And the name Joshua simply means Yahweh is salvation. Salvation is of God. When we think about the authorship of the book of Joshua, tradition says that it was written by Joshua himself, and there's never been any reason to doubt that or to reject that view. It has been a commonly held view uh, all through the Christian era, and there's no reason for us to doubt or dispute the fact that it was actually written by the name character. When we come to chapter 3, the crossing of the Jordan River by the children of Israel, it can be dated about 1407 B.C. When we consider this, the last event recorded in the book at, uh, at the assembly at Shechem was in uh, his farewell address to the nation in chapter 24. So we begin in, in 1407, and we go to the final uh, speech that Joshua gives, his farewell address to the nation. The comment by, jo uh, by Caleb in Joshua 14.7 would lead us to compute the length of time which this effort against the Canaanites took. So it gives us a pretty good clue now as to how long of a time frame we have covered in the book of Joshua. We're told that Caleb was 40 when he had, uh, he had been sent with those spies to go into the land from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And they came back. Joshua and Caleb before us gave a positive uh, a review of faith and said, we can do it. We can go in. God will give us the victory. But he was 40 years of age when that took place. And now he's 85 at the time that he was given his personal inheritance in the tribal territory of Judah. So 45 years have elapsed between the time that he went in with Joshua and the 10 others to spy out the land and his inheriting his allotment in the territory of Judah. So of those 45 years that elapsed, 38 or so were spent in those 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And so seven years must have been spent in the united conquest of Canaan. So the historical events of the book of Joshua would cover approximately seven years. Now, the book of Joshua illustrates two great principles of Scripture, not just Old Testament historical Scripture, but biblical Scripture. Number one, God is a man of war. Now, that's stated explicitly in Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. But in the book of Joshua, we see God being a man of war in the sense that he leads the people of Israel to go in and take possession of the land that he had long ago promised Abram and all of his descendants. And God is showing himself powerful and mighty in a military sense. This focuses on that concept that we have in the New Testament, where we're told that this is the victory which overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, yes, they went in and they fought the battles, but it was their trust in God, ultimately, that gave them the victory. We see that clearly in the very first battle, as the people of Israel move across the Jordan River and they're confronted with the fortified city of Jericho. And the amazing story as to how God gave the victory. Uh, the Israelites didn't fight. They just simply marched around that city once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, and the walls fell, and they were able to take possession. And, of course, they did engage in, in war, but it was God who gave the victory. It is faith, belief, trust in God that gives us victory in life. We learn that clearly from the book of Joshua. Now, as we move on into the book of Judges, the book of Judges uh, spans a historical time frame, and uh, if you add up all the years of the Judges, you'll come to approximately 450 years, but there's obviously some overlapping in the years of the Judges. So uh, we would reduce that number of 450 considerably, and yet we're still covering a very, very long period of time in historical records that are recorded for us in the book of Judges.
So the seventh book of the Old Testament is named for those series of 12 individuals that God raises up as, I guess we could call the military leaders, judges, in uh, emergency situations where the people of Israel find themselves in desperate need of a leader. The following observations can just simply be made about Israel's judges, and uh, we can see some parallels that we could make between God calling and raising up these judges and God calling people even to the modern day. First of all, they were God's vice regents in the land. They were operating under the leadership of God. Now, let me let me say that this is an extremely important time in Israel's history because they have made the move now from Moses' leadership to Joshua's leadership. Joshua has now died and passed off the scene. And so they have no one leader. They have no king. As a matter of fact, it says twice in this book that there was no king in the land. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. God would raise up these judges to be leaders for the people of Israel, uh, God's vice regent working under the leadership of God to give God's leadership to the people. Next, all of them seem to have experienced some sort of a call from God. They didn't just arbitrarily decide one day that, well, my people need some help and I, I'm the one that can do it. There's a sense of a calling of God on their lives. They're called for very specific reasons, for very specific purposes. And that call from God is what gives them the courage, the motivation, uh, the compulsion to do the work of God. Because they had overwhelming tasks that were assigned to them in very trying and difficult times in the confines of the history of the nation of Israel. So they experienced a divine call of God to take upon themselves this task of uh, judging the people. In the book of Judges, we don't see a succession from one judge to the next judge. One doesn't live and serve and then die and then someone else follow in the succession. Uh, they're, they're not really related to one another. They're working in different parts of the nation at different times. And so there's, there's really no form of succession that we see in the judges. They're individuals that are individually called by God to serve God in this manner for a specified period of time to meet certain specific needs of the people. They had no power to make laws. God had already given the law to Moses on Sinai. They had no power to make laws, but they were to en enact the laws to enforce the law that God had already given. They had no power even to interpret the law. That was not their task. That was the responsibility of the priesthood. Theirs, again, was simply to enforce the law of God. So they were not able to make laws. They were not able to enact laws. They were not even able to interpret law. They just enforced the law that God had given. Their responsibility, their major responsibility was to enforce God's law and to bring rest to the land by getting the people to return to God. After they had strayed away from God, God had raised up enemies to uh, bring judgment, and then they would cry out to God. God would raise up a judge, and their purpose was to enforce the law and bring the people in repentance back to God so that God could then give rest to the land. As we look at the tribal effort to conquer Canaan and consider that it lasted seven plus years under the leadership of Joshua, once Joshua had accomplished that task, he then assigned the tribes to their territories 
within the land. The individual tribes then were required to eliminate any remaining enclaves of Canaanites, and this process began actually before the death of Joshua in about 1387 BC. But their task now was to complete the uh, job that Joshua had started. Moses leads them out of Egypt. Joshua leads them into the promised land and through tremendously uh, important strategic moves, he goes in and he conquers the land. He divides the north from the south. He goes on two different campaigns to completely decimate the people in the land. But there are still inhabitants of the land left. The task now is to drive out the remaining inhabitants of the land so that the people of Israel possess the land in its entirety. And for a while, it seemed to be working. It seemed to be that the, the, the 12 different tribes were taking seriously their responsibility to clear the land of the Canaanites. But eventually and gradually, they moved from conquest toward toleration, from toleration to accommodation, and from accommodation to assimilation. In other words, the people that were to be driven out of the land were left in the land, were tolerated, accommodated, and finally assimilated, thereby showing their disobedience to the command of God to completely, absolutely rid the land of all vestiges of all of these people groups that were there before uh, Joshua led them in conquest of the land. So, this led to Israel departing from the Lord. And because of that, God began to raise up enemies, invaders, to invade the land. It started with the invasion of Cushan Rishathaim from Mesopotamia, and that was about 1367, and that was the time that the period of the judges actually began. Judges was composed after the death of Moses, uh, of Joshua, excuse me, and after the captivity of the land. And that rep, uh, reference to the captivity of the land possibly and probably is a reference to the Philistine captivity of Israel. And that occurred during the judgeship of Eli, which we have recorded in 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 6. Jewish tradition says that Samuel actually authored the book of Judges, and again, there's no reason to doubt that. Uh, Jewish tradition has long accepted that, and so it's probably accurate to accept the fact that Samuel did indeed write the book of Judges. Now, what is the purpose, the immediate purpose of this author? Well, Simply put, it was to record the major events from the death of Joshua leading up to the founding of the monarchy. So that historical time frame from, Mo, uh, from Joshua's death all the way up to the time that the people cried out for a king so that they could be like all other people. Uh, that's the purpose. The immediate purpose was to record those events in that historical time frame. And by doing this, the author is actually attempting to explain how the necessity of the monarchy actually arose in the land. It was during a time of social and political upheaval and chaos. And that, of course, was a result of the people living in disobedience to God's word. And they cried out, instead of allowing God to continue to lead them in a theocratic way, they wanted to be a governed, uh, governed by a king, a monarch, so that they could be like all other nations. Now, there are two key verses. Uh, there's a lot of key verses, but there are two especially important key verses that we need to note in the book of Judges. Judges 
The first of those is in chapter 2, verse 19. It came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. God raised up Moses and then Joshua and then uh, for the immediate years following the death of Joshua, the elders led the people and, and they continued to follow the leadership of the Lord, but ultimately they came to reject it and they became corrupt, more corrupt than their fathers by following their gods, serving them and bowing down to them. It shows a complete reversal. No longer are they striving to live in obedience to the word of God, to the teachings of that word, but now they're rejecting that word, going their own way, doing their own thing, living by their own rules, everybody doing what's right in his own eyes. And that's our second key verse, chapter 17 and verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Book of Judges consists of a series of cycles. And those cycles are rebellion, retribution, repentance, and rest. The people would rebel against God, against the Word of God. They would reject that, walk away from it. They would, as it says, do what was right in their own eyes because they had no king over them. That would lead to a time where God would break down his hedge of protection around them and they would experience retribution the wrath, the judgment of God. This would last until the people came to their spiritual senses and in a spirit of repentance cried out to God for deliverance and God would raise up a judge and during the lifetime of that judge there would be rest in the land. So the author of this book traces how Israel deteriorated from good spiritual health in the days of Joshua through the ages, stages of spiritual illness to seriously spiritually ill and ultimately to critically spiritually ill. Demonstrates the terrible consequences of disobedience to God. And this, this principle is repeated over and over and over, not just Old Testament, but as uh, in, the, in the New Testament as well. If we choose to live a life of obedience, God blesses. If we choose to live a life of disobedience, we reap the consequences. As Paul says, whatever man sows, that is what that man will reap. If we live a life of righteousness, we will reap the rewards and benefits of righteousness. If we live a life of wickedness, we will reap the consequences of that wickedness. The Book of Judges is a clear demonstration of that biblical principle. And the people of Israel are the people of our modern day. Disregard God's command to obey Him in the sense of uh, Israel in the days of the judgments. It was their uh, dereliction of the duty to drive out the Canaanites. And that led to toleration and compromise and intermarriage and ultimately apostasy, complete falling away from God. This in turn led to political disunity and chaos, foreign oppression from their enemies, social chaos, and individual immorality. Again, everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. So twice the book declares, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Seven times the book of Judges states that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It is a sordid, sorrowful tale of people who decide to walk away from God rather than to walk with God. And the principles that are gleaned there are still as effective today and as true today as ever. 
When we decide to do what is right in our own eyes, we lose the blessings of God and begin doing evil in the eyes of God. So these two emphases actually stand out. The man, the natural man left to himself is inclined to do evil. We all have the propensity, the tendency to move toward evil in our natural state. And even after being born again into the family of God, we still have the tendency and even the propensity to revert back to that old Adamic nature where we walk in this uh, disobedience to God rather than walking in obedience to God. And without the revelation from God and the motivation to obey the revelation from God, we will all ultimately and inevitably choose the path of destruction. It's by the grace of God we are led out of that that we're given the desire. As Paul says in Philippians, that God gives us the desire to obey him. We need to, we need to walk in obedience. As Paul says in Romans, walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't do things our own way as the people of Israel did over and again in the book of Judges. But follow the revel, uh, revelation of God and have the will to obey that revelation of God so that we do not choose the path of destruction. Judges illustrates methods that God employs in dealing with his people. We see in the book of Judges that the anger of God burns against sin. God does not take sin lightly. He never has. He never will. The ultimate illustration of that is seen on the cross when Jesus paid the horrific penalty for the sin that we have committed against God and how God's anger burns against that sin. We're told that he actually, God actually sold his people. He gave his people over into the hand of their enemies. God will take whatever measures necessary to get our attention and to move us back in the direction of repentance and renewal. Once God said uh, to have strengthened the hand of an enemy against Israel, God actually strengthened the hand. God raises up all through the Old Testament. We see God raising up enemies of Israel to bring judgment against them because of their disobedience and their waywardness and their rebellion and their apostasy. And God then uh, is moved to ensure that his people are striving for a state of purity and holiness and God being pure holiness himself will not, cannot, ignore sin, but must, according to his own decree, punish sin. It also uh, illustrates the principle that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Now again, we need to be reminded constantly of the fact that Paul raises that rhetorical question, should we just go ahead and sin so that God's grace may abound? His answer is, God forbid. How can anyone who is dead sin live any longer therein. God's grace does abound when repentance is made, but God's judgment will fall when sin is left unchecked and unrepented. To gain the victory in Judges, God used some of the most unusual things in the hands of those that he raised up. He used an ox goad, a nail, some trumpets, pitchers, and lamps, a millstone, the jawbone of a donkey, rather unusual tools in the hand of a judge to bring about judgment 
but it just shows us that when God is in control, he can use whatever means he chooses, even the things that seem the most insignificant to us. God can use those things in the hands of his called individuals to bring about great victory and great deliverance. Some of the deliverers were very unlikely candidates, or at least from the human perspective. Think about some of the judges. An illegitimate son. A ladies' man. A left-handed butcher. A mother. A cowardly idol worshiper. The most unlikely of individuals are the ones God uses. Paul says the same things. God uses the most unusual of people, the weak, the uneducated, the ignorant. He uses people that we would look at with disdain, disdain and disgust, and yet God looks at them and uses them in tremendous and powerful ways for his glory. And aren't we glad that God continues to call people just like us into the tremendous work of sharing the good news of his son Jesus? Well, let's turn our attention now for just a few minutes to the book of Ruth. There are two books in the Bible that bear the name of women, Ruth and Esther, and both of these women were very good women and actually, in the biblical sense, very great women. In chapter 1 and verse 1 of the book, it tells us the setting, the historical setting for the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled. And yet when we consider the contents of the book of Ruth, it sort of stands in contrast to what we see in the book of Judges. In Judges, there are stories of crime and bloodshed, lawlessness and revenge. But in the book of Ruth, well, there's the story of simple love, simple devotion, a just, a just a beautiful, beautiful story. The providence of God is clearly seen as he moves in the affairs of this family to bring about his will. Such an amazing story of the providence of God, the hand of God at work. Actually, this book was originally a part of the book of Judges. And uh, I, I guess the reason for that is because it's set in the historical time frame of the book of Judges. It was taken from the book of Judges sometime after uh, the time of Josephus, which is 90 AD. And most think that it was probably done to help ease the, uh, the, the painstaking effort to read this book on the day of Pentecost as being uh, an addendum to the book of judges. Boaz was the great grandfather of David, so taking into consideration the lifetime of David, a date of about 1130 BC would probably be a, a pretty accurate guess at the date of the events of this book. In the book of Judges, we see idolatry and immorality, and in the book of Ruth, we see a uh, that, that everything was not as black and bleak and dark as it appeared to be in the book of Judges. There were some bright, shining lights, even in the confines of that dark historical period. Boaz is described as a man of wealth or standing, and he's portrayed in the book as a devout and obedient follower of God. Again, stands in stark contrast to the overall uh, message of the book of Judges. Ruth's devotion to the Lord is even more amazing. She's devoted to the Lord in spite of her pagan upbringing. She's devoted to the Lord in spite of seeing God's people in circumstances of suffering, and also in spite of Israelite prejudice against her people. This is an amazing avowal of this woman's faith and devotion to God. And she still chose to worship God and to identify with his people rather than with her own people. Even though there's no personal messianic prophecy found in Judges and Ruth, uh, 
there's rich typology that is presented, and we see that especially in the book of Ruth, because there we're told about the kinsman redeemer and the qualifications to be a kinsman redeemer, those qualifications being he has to be a blood relative, he has to have the means to purchase the forfeited inheritance, he has to be willing to buy it back, and he has to be willing to marry the wife of the deceased. All of these point to Jesus Christ as our great kinsman redeemer. The genealogy of the book of Ruth ends with a story, just a romantic story that tells us that this story leads up to the genealogy of the Messiah. So the book of Ruth plays a pivotal and important role in Old Testament history. God bless you as you do your readings this week and as you do your work. I look forward to reading your responses. And God bless you. Hope you have a great week and we'll continue on next week.